Welcome to the Multiply Your Success podcast, where each week we help growth-minded entrepreneurs and franchise leaders take the next step in their expansion journey. I'm your host, Tom Dufour, CEO of Big Sky Franchise Team, and a very Merry Christmas to all of you that are deciding to tune into our final episode of 2023. So we are launching here on Christmas Day. Thank you so much. I hope if you are tuning in that you've had a chance to enjoy wonderful Christmas holiday with your friends and family and those that are near and dear to you. If you're maybe up early listening to this, glad you're here. And today's episode is extra fun and special because we are recapping 2023 and highlighting eight of our most popular and most downloaded episodes of 2023. And so we're going to play some snippets of each one just as a flashback reminder as we close out here. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Our first episode from our top episodes in 2023 is episode number 153, which is an interview with Matt Hill, who is the CEO of One Tree Planted, which is a nonprofit organization that's planting trees all over the world. And it's an organization that we support. So let's hear what Matt had to say. But keeping it simple, and like you said, optimist, not doom and gloom, not too technical because people are paralyzed. And, you know, for example, I keep hearing carbon, carbon, carbon. What is carbon? What is a ton of carbon? How does that work? What is my carbon footprint? How is it, you know, being calculated and all that stuff? But at the end of the day, you know, I always just say it's the consumption of stuff. We buy a lot of stuff. We fly around, you know, and there's little things you can do that will call it minimize what you do, but you can't get down to a zero. So when you might donate $100 and know that you planted 100 trees in your local community or picked a project that's maybe in Australia that's helping with biodiversity over there, you know, it's tangible. People, they get it. You list on your website and other resources based on certain number of trees planted help neutralize or offset your own general consumption as an average person. Would you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, you know, the average North American, you know, it's about 20 tons of carbon just based on, you know, you go to work and bring your kids to school and heating your home, all that type of stuff. So when you're planting trees, trees sequester carbon, right? And then there's a lot of different types of trees. Some trees will sequester more carbon faster. Some trees live longer. So a whole bunch of factors, but we have a really sharp team that really do that modeling in terms of understanding that. And then there's three, just the thing for your listeners and everything to understand, there, there's a soft claim. So when you go and plant 1,000 trees, we can calculate based on the geography and types of trees what that should be sequestering. But it's a soft claim. Then you can go and get a third party that would just audit to just kind of double verify that what we're saying is actually true. And then there's certified projects, which are gold standard, Vera, and a lot of work and you know aspects go into that. So those are kind of the three realms for the average person to know what's out there. I think that for someone that's thinking of trying to offset their own, right? You hear about this carbon footprint mm -hmm. and how can I reduce this and so on. Mm -hmm. And this is a very simple way to know that what you're doing is making an impact on some of that. What are a couple of ways here, Matt, for people to get involved? How can they learn more about what you're doing? I mean, you can go to onetreeplanted.org, really appreciate it. And you can see what's going on, see the amazing projects that are out there. The other thing I think is, you know, looking up tree planting events, you know, Earth Month just passed eight, the month of April. And there's a lot, we, we had over 100 tree planting events that we organized around the world that were free for people to come out to. And then just, you know, it goes beyond trees. I mean, I went down to Dominican, we looked at a site that we are working with a partner and we saw the communities and then we did a beach cleanup, right? I'm in this environmental space. And when I was doing the beach cleanup to see how much plastic was there and how much styrofoam and all that stuff was broken up and how much of this we you know, digest in our system. So there's a lot of different things that you can consciously do that isn't making an extreme effort. And I'm not saying for everybody out here to go buy a Prius tomorrow, but you know, there's little things you can do, bike to work, walk to work, take public tra transportation, use reusables. And I think it's these small little things that are pretty easy to incorporate in your lifestyle that collectively make a difference. Our next interview is with Brian Beers, the multi-unit franchisee that went from zero franchises, then to six, then to over 30 locations, grossing more than $40 million per year with the franchises that he owns as a multi-unit franchise. And here's a little snippet from his interview. 
as you've grown through this over the last roughly, you know, eight, 10 years or so, what do you know now that if you could tell yourself something, you know, when you're first getting started? A couple things. I mean, sometimes I think we've we've held on to people who weren't good for way too long that like hurt hurt the business, right? You have somebody, you know, they're cancerous, you know, they're like hurting it, but for whatever reason, I'm, we're, I'm blinded by it or just like what whatever it is. And so sometimes we, we've made it, you know, and, and I take responsibility where, you know, I've hired the guy and I should have fired the guy and I didn't. And then it like leads to all these other problems, right? Because you have like the wrong, the wrong people in the wrong seats. And so that'd be advice is like, if once you know someone's right, like there's really, or right once you know someone's not right, you there's really like no turning around. Like most people don't get magically better. And so part of it is like re- getting really good and having a lot of clarity around like who is the right person, especially in these leadership roles and working really hard to find those people and retain those people. And if they're not right, like, you know, find the right people. And so that, that's a big one. The other one, like I mentioned before, the, the limiting belief that, you know, hey, I thought that, you know, because we we had other opportunities to acquire other stores, even in market and just thinking like, kind of thinking small about that. You know, and one of the big lessons is like, if if someone else can do it, like I can do it, you know, like none of this is like rocket science, right? Like, and we're kind of, we have the mentality and we, you know, my, my brother and I have kind of like, we'll like say yes, and then we'll figure it out, right? Because we're, we're pretty confident that we can figure it out. So even in the thing, in, you know, going into New Jersey or buying these new stores, or, you know, we're going to have this new, this new venture and this new franchise and a lot of these things, it's like, we're, we're, you know, we believe in ourselves. We believe other people can do it, that we can do it. And I think some people just like overthink, they want to analyze, they want to create all these like big spreadsheets and they have this, like all the details. But at the end of the day, like, I don't know, I think you just got to trust your intuition sometimes. And so a lot of times we'll say yes. And then, then we'll, then we kind of figure it out. And sometimes we mess up and then we just change it. Like other times, you know, we made, we made the right decisions and I think indecision by people is a huge problem. The next podcast episode is episode number 154 with Jeffrey Klubeck, who shared with us about his book, The Integrity Game. By the way, props to you, Tom, like for doing it because it's a great question. Normally, I have to introduce this concept, but for you to bring it out is really exciting for me. So I really mean what I'm saying when I say thank you right there. So imagine I'm doing public speaking on the integrity game as a keynote, right? And I'll ask everybody, by show of hands, how many of you believe you have integrity? You can imagine 100% of the room raises their hand. And I say, keep your hands up and repeat after me. I, I do, do solemnly swear, swear not to shoot the messenger in 45 minutes, right? As an attention getter. But I want good ratings. I want to be invited back as the speaker, right? So hang on before I offend anybody. Let's make sure we're talking about the same thing. And to your question... That's right. Well, what is it? And I'll let the audience tell me. This is the interactive part of the the keynote, right? What is integrity? And I always get two answers. I alluded to them a second ago. I'll repeat them now in the context of this question. One answer I always get is be your word. Do what you say you're going to do. And then people nod like you just did. Okay. And then we pin that on the board. And then I'll say, does anybody else have an answer? And then somebody will say, do the same thing when nobody's watching that you would when somebody is watching or do the right thing regardless of who's watching. And then I see your face again light up. So we'll pin those two answers on the board. Do the right thing regardless of who's watching and be your word. Anybody else? Anybody else? And usually even if somebody says the same answer in a flowery way or a different language pattern, right? It's still the same thing. And it's those are judgment-based interpretations, judgment-based understandings, right? So here's what's interesting. When you talk about integration, over here, when we be our word, we're integrating. There is a coming together with word and behavior. And over here, when we do the right thing, when, regardless of who's watching, there's an integration, a coming together of behavior with values, morals, or ethics. So in both of the examples that I pull from audiences or that is at the tip of our tongue or the forefront of our mind, when we think about integrity, if we were asked to define it, we would say, be your word or do the right thing. So in both of those cases, there's a coming together of one thing with another. And here's what's cool, Tom. In both cases, it's behavior. That's the evidence of our integrity. It's not what I thought I was going to do, not what I meant to do, not how I would describe myself if asked in public, not the peer pressure to raise my hand so I'm not seeing like, you know, right? But like, what did you do? Did you do what, did the behavior integrate with your word? And did the behavior integrate with your values, morals, and ethics? So we, I like these two answers because it allows us to introduce the notion of integration. Now, where it falls apart, though, is if I said I was going to, you know, drink 18 beers before this podcast interview, and then I drink 18 beers before the podcast interview, I will have done what I said I was going to do. But could I claim integrity? And we both know the answer is no. And then on the other side over here, you sometimes time is money. Sometimes patience is a virtue. 
sometimes if you never quit, you never lose. And sometimes you better know when to cut your losses. So is it what's right, a moving target? And doesn't it shift from culture to context to situ? The example that I give a lot lately, coming even coming out of the holidays, four months removed, five months removed from the holidays, that we would all agree you should never lie. But there's this thing called Elf on a Shelf that has us lying to our children for 26 days every year, right? So don't lie, except when, but okay, but if it's convenient and if I'm going to avoid. So what's right or wrong is a moving target. And most people are sitting here in judgment of others, right? And I, I, I want to put an end to all of that. So we like the idea of integration, coming together of two or more things, but word and behavior and behavior and values isn't enough. I believe there are 10 things that we want to bring together, that if we work towards bringing 10 things together, if we have answers to 10 question sets and we make sure those answers integrate, we're going to have more focus, more resilience, more, more success. We're going to attract the right people. We're going to have to be better time managers, on and on and on and on and on. So the coming together, and it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing, Tom, because they start with the same six letters, integrity and integration. But not one person I've ever asked, what is integrity? will use the word integration in their answer because most of us were ready to judge others instead of look within. And our next guest is Kenny Rose, who's the founder of FranShares, the fractional franchise investing organization. And he's from episode 176. Yeah, it's funny. Some people won't like this, but it's higher slow. I've heard a lot of people say hire fast, fire fast, and I couldn't disagree more. You know, my very first hire for the company, I could not have done a I could have gotten a better person, but it took me like five months or so, maybe even longer. You know, I was like, oh, I can keep building stuff while I look for them. I had like a thousand applications for it. You know, people saw that we were funded and stuff. And I was just like, I, it, it can't be a, oh, yeah, good. Or they, sh- they could probably do it. It's got to be a burning. This is the person for the job. And I ended up hiring a recruiter because I still couldn't find that person, even out of all those applications, interviews I did. And then the recruiter brought me a couple people. And then I met Brandon, our first hire. And this guy is just an absolute machine and like best marketer I could possibly imagine working with. And so I learned like, okay, you need to be very careful with who you hire and just take your time. And even when we've been hiring lately, you know, we talk with the team and we'll have conversation and it's like, I don't know. And then I'm like, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. And so, you know, we literally passed on candidates in the last rounds because it just wasn't a hell yes. And then after we did that, brought on the next people and it was like, oh, hell yeah, there we go. And so we've got an amazing team that's just done incredible for, honestly, a few of us there are. VCs are like baffled by what we've done with, but now we're at five people. And uh, there's like, I don't know how you do this. And I'm like, I hired very slowly. You know, that's what I recommend people is just like, I know it's really tempting to jump on, oh, they they check all the boxes, but it's like, yeah, they can check boxes, but are they the person? You know, if it's not the person, start over because it's a lot more expensive and frustrating to hire the wrong person. And the multiplier you get from hiring the right people is just, it's so hard to actually quantify. Our next podcast to highlight is episode number 172 with our guest, Scott Greenberg, who is the author of The Wealthy Franchisee. He's a speaker and a writer, and he shares with us some of his nuggets of wisdom. My overall philosophy about human performance in anything is that most of us can operate at a much better level, whether it's in business, in sports, in our personal lives, that kind of thing. And we have what it takes within ourselves to make that happen. Rather than waiting for certain circumstances or hoping that someone gives us permission, I think if we always start by looking in the mirror and making sure that we're bringing our A game, that's where we're going to have the most influence on everything around us. And so I guess I would encourage people to not to blame yourself, but to empower yourself. Look in the mirror, be the best version of you. And then use your best to bring out the best in others. And I think that's a pretty effective formula for success. Our next guest is Scott Brimehorst, the Vice President of Franchise Development at Discover Strength. And he's shared with us how he took the leap into franchising and shared a great story on episode number 156. And here's a little snippet from that interview. My multipliers, as I thought about this question, are really the people that are surrounding me and, and how... I've really tried to to grow that network. Anybody who's listening who's maybe in this kind of a position where you're pondering this move, maybe it's internally in your own company. You, you were in operations and now you're going to be the franchise development person. I've never been told no. Like You've never not answered a text message. So when I talk about multiplying things and people, it's that network that I've been able to 
in just one year go from backdoor neighbor is pizza ranch cdo and and now i've got all kinds of people that i can rely on and and just kind of help me push through things and so that multiplier is not a a book necessarily or a system it's just the fact that you got to be vulnerable a little bit and say i don't obviously know all of this but other people do and i'm going to lean on them and then someday i want to be that guy that you know maybe somebody else leans on or maybe some new you know person in their role just wants to have a cup of coffee and and see what maybe the experience has taught me that i can share so that hopefully that multiplier becomes a multiplier for somebody else our next podcast is episode number 169 where we interviewed Luke Charlton, who shared with us the secrets to creating a responsive email marketing list. You have to do the right things to build up that build up that trust. Now, this is where a lot of us business owners, we take some shortcuts with our with our marketing and selling. One of those being, you know, if you want to create a responsive list, it never starts with your solution, right? It never starts with your product. Whatever it is that you're selling, it could be an e-commerce product, it could be, you know, trying to sell a franchise, whatever it is. It doesn't start with how cool your solution is. It always starts with the market, what the market wants, what they need. So their fears, their frustrations, their desires, what keeps them up at night and knowing that market better than they know themselves. And then when you know that, then you can create a message that's going to attract them. And this is where I say like, you know, we business owners can sometimes take shortcuts in that we don't do the research properly. We kind of like, oh yeah, I know my market and we'll just leave it there without actually, you know, I've had some conversations with them, but they don't, we don't actually do the elbow grease, all that work to really find out all about our market, including all of our competitors and what are our, what messages our competitors are using. And I say this is actually where the money is made because this is where your prospects will give you the language that will convert them. With your, with your campaign, whether that's advertising or whether you're doing like a JV promotion, email promotion or whatever. So you start there and that's really critical. So when you go to write your email campaigns, you can craft a message that is in alignment with what they're telling you that they're struggling with. And with copywriting, email copywriting, sales letters, whatever it is, VSLs, webinars, all you're really doing is just reflecting back the same language to the prospect. Like your prospect will literally give you the words to convert them in your emails, to get them on an appointment or whatever the goal is for your email or whatever copywriting you're doing, they will literally give you the words to use in your copy to get that action that you want them to take. So in terms of creating a responsive list, like the first thing is like know your market better than they know themselves. And the next thing is have a base level knowledge of copywriting, like study it. We even if, you know, it's even if it doesn't come naturally to you as a business owner, it's it's, you know, I was I'm hiring at the moment in my that other company with my business partners. Like we we just hired some salespeople and we're bringing on appointment setters. And one of the things that I realized, employee attraction, like attracting employees to your cup to come work for you, is just the same as client attraction, right? I had to like I had to write the ad for this setter position and sales position like as a sales letter, right? I had to write all the benefits and I had to think about okay, what would what would an appointment setter, like what was this dream employee that I would want, right? So think of dream client, dream employee. What would the market want in terms of this position? Like what are they struggling with? And I wrote all the benefits. Like you can do it part-time, you can work your own hours, here are the good commissions, we're a growing team, great culture, all these things, right? The point is, from my copywriting experience, I could create a quote-unquote ad to attract employers. I had like 80 80 women, I think it was, apply for this position. We only need need two people. So that was from two emails that I sent out. Two emails I sent out to our list, 80 people applied. And that was from my my copywriting ability. And so I was thinking, you know, learning copywriting will help you in so many different different areas of of your business and also life, you know, (laughs) negotiating with your your kids or your spouse is one of them. But but yeah, so knowing a baseline level of copywriting is very helpful to create a responsive list. And then getting a mentor, and now and then uh, is also really critical. So you know, we can't see our own blind spots. Even I have mentors look over my own copy because you know sometimes we're we're too close. It's the curse of the curse of expert knowledge. We, we we're so deep in our own solution that we sometimes can't see the blind spots. Like we can't see the the best angle or headline for that particular campaign that we're doing or copy. So even myself, after all these years, I still get people to look over my copy now. In terms of strategy, which is probably what you're looking for, I always like to set the the context there because I feel like when I when I get into like 
people always ask like, well, how did you become successful with copywriting and advertising? It's, it's what I just discussed. If people are always looking for like, what's the secret email hack or what's the secret Facebook ad hack? What's the new placement? It's not about that. It's about the those fundamentals that I just went over that people like they've heard before, but that really is where the money is made. Now, in terms of creating a responsive list, you do all that, you start writing messages that your list actually wants to receive. That's number one, right? Write a message that they want to receive. One of the ways that I do that is I tell stories in all of my emails. I say 95% or more of my emails are story driven. I love stories for a few reasons. They're naturally entertaining. All of us can tell stories. That's how we were brought up. That's how we communicate to our friends, our family. We're always telling, telling stories. So it comes naturally to everyone. Stories are also a really great way to illustrate your point. Like if you're, you're trying to, you know, to talk about a certain principle or a certain strategy that you help with or whatever, telling the story about how you discovered this or a client or, you know, telling a story about, hey, I read this news article and this was really funny, but what I really learned from this news article was LMNOP. So a story, yeah, it, it really illustrates the point that in a really natural way. So I tell the story and then I transition to the to the call to action. But again, that call to action is an offer that I know that my market wants because I've done I've done the research. And the final top podcast episode of 2023 for us to highlight is our interview with Justin Nasiri, CEO of Executive Presence, whose show title was Why Every Executive Needs to Be Active on LinkedIn. And here's what he had to say. Yeah, there's four things that people consistently mess up specifically with LinkedIn. The first one is it's about people, not the company. And so anyone who uses LinkedIn, I would ask you, when was the last time you engaged with the post from a company? It's probably been a while. When was the last time you engaged with a post with someone you know or someone that they know? Probably much more often. So we see companies missing the mark when they put all of their ammo behind their company page, which is really just table stakes you're going to grow a following through your key leaders. That tends to be the C-suite, not always, but whoever you consider your primary brand ambassadors, that's the people that people are going to connect with, not the nameless, faceless company page. That's number one. Number two, we already talked about educate, don't sell. Number three is it's all about original content. So we just released a major study. We looked at a thousand of our client posts from the month of May. And one of the things that we found is that if you repost content, you get about a quarter of the views of other content. If you publish an article, you get about a third of the views of other content. LinkedIn algorithmically rewards native content written specifically for LinkedIn. So this is the text post. Maybe it's a post with a photo. Maybe it's a carousel. Maybe it's a video. But it is content that is uploaded specifically to LinkedIn. And it makes sense, right? If I post an article that drives traffic away from LinkedIn, I wouldn't expect LinkedIn to give that a lot of exposure. You want to write content specifically for LinkedIn. And then the last one, and this is the biggest mindset shift for our clients, in order to be top of mind relevant with an audience on LinkedIn, you need to publish content two to five times per week, which you know most executives post four times a year. And so the big judo flip for us with our clients is not two to four times per year, two to five times per week, which is an insane volume of content. But the last thing that I'd say on that is one of the strategies on LinkedIn is activating your network. These are people who know you, like you, and trust you, but they're just not thinking about you. So we want to have that top of mind relevance. That's where this frequency comes into mind. And then the second is really boosting them up as a thought leader. We talk about how we turn leaders into thought leaders. There is a formula for this, but it does include very frequently publishing content. All right. And as we close out this episode and this year, I hope that you take a moment to reflect back on 2023. Use this week between Christmas and New Year's Day to pause and really be intentional to reflect back. Reflect on all that you have accomplished, all that you have overcome, all of the adversity and challenges that may have come your way over the course of the year, and how you've been able to respond, and in some cases, to swerve, dodge, avoid, or overcome some of these things that have come your way. And I know 
all of us have had our own fair share of challenges. And I, I hope you reflect back on those challenges and opportunities that you've been able to overcome and pursue throughout this past year. So please take some time to reflect and really be intentional about it. I'm going to, I know I mentioned that, but I am going to do so and be intentional on doing that this year before I skip over what happened in 2023 and be so focused on the upcoming year in 2024. So Merry Christmas again and wishing you all a great conclusion to 2023. And so that's the episode today, folks. Please make sure you subscribe to the podcast and give us a review. And remember, if you or anyone you know might be ready to franchise your business or take your franchise company to the next level, please connect with us at BigSkyFranchiseTeam.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to having you back next week. 